Good. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Tzachi and myself from Mellanox, and we'll be talking um, about high availability. How do you use uh, Linux existing high availability mechanism to control traffic which is actually uh, either totally or halfway offloaded from the kernel? So you want to use existing mechanism to influence traffic which does not pass through the kernel. And we'll use a few examples, one of physical switch, and uh, one of RDMA traffic, and another one for SRIOV. Um, so um, just a small background to this audience. I guess everybody knows. Uh, in the kernel, there's the bonding mechanism, which was, I'm sure it was in 2.4, maybe even before in 2.2 kernel. It's a legacy uh, driver. And uh, in kernel 3.3, Jiri, which is here, introduced the team driver. Hi. So um, bo both those drivers, they would, exp they would exp expose a, what we call a software NAT device or a virtual NAT device that control other NAT devices and applies the high availability on them. Um, and in the, in the kernel jargon, in the networking jargon, we call them upper devices. Um, and, the lower de and the other devices are called lower devices. I, I personally also prefer it because it's more politically correct than master and slave. I don't want to use the word slave, um, which is not funny. Um, th those drivers typically have different mode of operation, uh, either only high availability or uh, also load balancing. And of course, the IEEE uh, LACP lag is, is supported. And this is maybe the most general and interesting case. Um, as I said, bonding is legacy and team is more, um, is newer. Um, the team driver is more uh, modular and flexible. You can easily extend it. And also, um, the state machine is managed in user space. So there's a daemon and library and, um, but they're both, they're both used in the kernel. And also the mechanism will introduce, will um, talk today, the notifiers were recently uh, also enhanced by Jiri that uh, you could use um, the framework we, we are um, proposing, we are showing today would work for both of them. It's not that you have to have your right to write your code to one of them. Um, so so what, what, what we are trying to talk on today, so, so again, uh, the idea that you have net devices and you would configure bonding or teaming on them, and then um, the state machine of Linux or bond will determine how the traffic goes, either the LACP state machine or the bonding test state machine, but then it would influence traffic that does not pass through the kernel networking stack. So what, uh, what type of traffic is that? Uh, a natural example is a physical switch, where uh, the recently introduced switch, the framework, would, would, under this framework, each, each port of the switch is a net device. Um, and if you're only using slow pass, of course the traffic goes through the kernel, but at some point, let's say you build a Linux bridge on, on top of that, and at that point, the traffic starts to be offloaded. Now you want to, naturally, you would like to, to build, to build the lag of two or more ports of the switch. So how would you do that? Each port is represented as a net device. As I said, you do bonding, and then this bonding is reflected into the hardware. That's, that's, the, first, uh, okay, that's the first example for a 100 gigabit switch. Um, um, the Mellanox, ML, the M MLX SW driver, and, and this solution for bonding, for teaming and lag is upstream in 4.5. The second use case, the second and the third use case are for NIC, uh, a 40 gigabit, and, and coming soon 100 gigabit uh, NIC. So of course in the NIC, uh, it's each port of the NIC is, is a net device as well. Um, and you have this RDMA stack uh, where the RDMA traffic, I'll explain later a bit what is RDMA for the native audience, some people are not familiar with that. So when you open an RDMA session, the, the control plane of the RDMA stack does use the network stack for stuff like uh, local route lookup and address resolution, but once you establish the RDMA connection, it's offloaded. Now you want this offloaded connection to be highly available uh, under the Linux networking stack. We'll see how, how this is done. So, so, um, so this, is, um, this is one case where you bond two ports of the, of the NIC uh, in the networking stack, and you open an RDMA session, and this RDMA session becomes highly available. Uh, this is one thing. And the other thing is SR, and, and this is upstream uh, with the MLX4 driver in, in 4.0. And the other use case is SRIOV. Uh, you would like to expose an interface to a virtual machine, which is only, also highly available, but it is, should be transparent to them. Like you don't want them to run any bonding or teaming or something. You want to do something on the hypervisor that uh, uh, 
that in a way the port you give them is a virtual port. So they are not affiliated necessarily with port one or port two of the NIC. You want them to run their traffic and don't care. And, and their traffic could be, of course, the plain internet and also RDMA. Okay? And this is also upstream in, in MLX4 with 4.5. Uh, and th this is the 40 gig uh, work we did with MLX4. Um, and the, the, next, the next on the line, what Sachi will explain later and show the, the architecture is for the MLX5 driver with the 100 gigabit. And this is uh, hopefully coming soon. So that, that's, that's a slide of the motivation, what we are trying to show today. Okay, so let's start with the, um, um, some background. There's a mechanism called the network notifiers, which is used for this, uh, uh, to implement that. So the, not the network notifier is, um, is a notification which is sent to subscribe consumers in the stack on a change which is either going to happen soon or just happened. It's, it's not only about to take, it's just a, it's a change which either is gonna happen soon or it happened. You'll see why we need both of them. Um, the notification contains what's going to happen, like there's a type of event, and the affected parties. For instance, in, the, uh, in this case, you would tell, uh, you will tell the lower device, hey, your upper is going to change, and this is your upper, okay? Or, the, or your upper has been changed, and this is your upper. Um, so the, the relevant notification for today's discussion is something called pre-change upper, which means your upper is going to be changed soon, or uh, change upper, which means your upper has been changed. Um, the driver can, um, let's see, what, how do you use that? In our case, uh, you know, hardware is, uh, is, un, is not unlimited, so some configuration doesn't make sense. So uh, the driver, the hardware driver, when they get the pre-change offer notification, they can refuse that. They can say, hey, we don't support that. So uh, the user space operation will fail. Uh, or they can say, okay, we're fine with that. Uh, so that's the pre-change upper notification. And then comes the change is wired, and there's, there's a second notification. Hey, you're, you're now part of the lag. So you have to configure the hardware, right? Because you, you want the hardware to actually start performing in this lag. Okay? Um, let's, let's see how does it work for the physical switch case. So uh, in this case, you have, uh, as we said, in the switch dev framework, um, each port is represented by a net device. So in this case, we have two ports, SW1P1 and SW1P2. There are two, two ports of the switch, and we want to put them in the lag. So the, the, the IP route 2 command would be IPLink set dev SW1P1 master, your master now is team 0. So uh, initially, the team driver will, will call into the core networking stack, and they will send this uh, pre-change upper notification. And as I said, in this case, for, for instance, uh, currently the MLX SW driver would refuse this if it's not an LACP lag, if it's other type, because that's, a, that's what we want to support now. So if it's not LACP or if there's something other, we, we can knock it, and then the change doesn't happen. Um, if we don't knock it, the operation continues, and then we get the second notification. And what we do at this point is that we observe that it's a new lag is being created for that physical switch, so, you, so the first action is to create this lag with the hardware, and the second action is to add this port into this lag, okay? So that's that what happens when you put the first port into the lag. Uh, the second, the second uh, the, um, when it's being done on the second port, so again, we, we, we still have the pre-change upper, uh, we, we, we confirm it's okay, and then in the change upper, we see that this lag already exists, so we just add this port into this lag, okay? Um, any questions on this use case of the physical switch? Someone? Yes. Oh, wait, please. Oh, you want to do it? We need, we need a mic. The mic. Yeah, so you offload the data path, obviously. What happens to the control packets, the LACP? Is that offloaded as well? The LACP packets go to the C. Oh, thank you. So uh, um, the, way, uh, the way the hardware is configured is that LACP packets, and I believe also IGMP and all the con Yes, correct, Jury, I'm correct. <laughs> so LACP packets and uh, IGMP and other stuff still goes into the CPU. So it's excellent. So the slow pass goes to the CPU, the data pass flows to the other. Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> so again, uh, correct. So the LACP state machines is still in Linux. All the controlling of stuff is still done by the CPU, and only the data pass is offloaded. Okay? Okay, uh, let's move to the second. Um, 
Okay, so now the scary slide on RDMA in the Div conference. <laughs> Joking. So what is RDMA? RDMA stands for Remote Direct Memory Access. Uh, it's a stack which was introduced in 2612, 10 years ago. Uh, and this stack uh, supports multiple transport for RDMA. I, our primary interest here, of course, in NetDev is the ro what we call Rocky, RDMA will converge Ethernet, uh, which is a standard. But this stack, just for your general knowledge, supports other transports such as InfiniBand and Arup. Uh, if we focus, we focus on Rocky today, uh, so Rocky V2 is upstream in 4.5, and it is actually a tunneling of a UDP. So those RDMA packets are actually UDP packets, which are a reserved port. And, um, and under the UDP, there's those RDMA packets. Uh, and it uses uh, the plain IPv4, IPv6 addressing of the, of the Ethernet NIC. So an RDMA NIC that supports Rocky, uh, and Melox will have two, Connectic 3 and Connectic uh, 4. Each one of them exposes per port a net device to the operating system which, uh, with, that support IPv4, IPv6. And those addresses are, using, are used to establish the Rocky uh, sessions. Um, Rocky applications use two APIs, one called the RDMA CM and the other one called Verbs. The RDMA CM is for the control pass, the Verbs is for the data pass. Um, and RDMA CM includes uh, three steps. One is address resolution, which is a local route lookup and ARP or ND to resolve the address of the other side. Second step is called route resolution, which is only relevant for InfiniBand network, is determining the path within the InfiniBand subnet. And the third stage is the connection establishment, how to, how to wire those RDMA connection uh, between the two nodes, and then you can offload it. So uh, the trick here is that the, the first step, the address resolution, is done by the network stack. And, uh, 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 th that's, uh, and we use IP addresses, and that's, that's our injection point to, to have the network stack to control the RDMA stack. Uh, the Verbs API, just for general knowledge, it supports primitives such as send, receive, and poll, and all this, and this is offloaded. Once you have the RDMA connection, you're already offloaded from the um, network stack. Um, and it uses uh, RD, something called RDMA device, which is IB structure, and this, each RDMA device has association with the net device. So that's your, uh, that's your crash course for RDMA. Uh, and another thing that in, in our case in Mellanox, the RDMA uh, uh, kernel slow pass also used for, uh, the, for wiring uh, user space uh, Ethernet traffic, such as DPDK. So uh, uh, it, plain Ethernet uh, traffic that is offloaded to user space, their control pass also goes through the kernel. Just uh, a detail that we can uh, influence our um, solution. Um, okay, so now I'll hand uh, to Tsachi. We'll explain the model for the uh, RDMA um, HA. Okay, thanks, so um, I'll use this mic again. Ah. Yes, so basically uh, what we described in this uh, slide is how we see the native uh, model versus the virtualization, which we'll see in the next slide, how we uh, basically expose uh, bonding and how actually bonding is uh, supported for RDMA device and uh, user mode Ethernet, as, as all described in the previous slide. So basically we, we wanted to have a very basic use and feel for users. They can use the same tools, same uh, use and feel uh, as they do today with Linux bonding or teaming uh, model. So configuration is the same. Uh, so basically, <coughs> for Rocky, we have a hardware-based transport object. We call them QP, Qt pair, and T transport interface uh, send. Those are uh, objects for uh, send uh, send uh, transport. So basically, we've added to those uh, hardware objects uh, a property called port affinity. So basically, a user can, uh, on creation time, specify which uh, actual uh, ports those uh, objects should uh, favor. So uh, that's for the uh, user mode Ethernet and the RDMA uh, bypass. Uh, code and for the actual RDMA uh, devices themselves that are associated with E0 and E1, uh, those are the devices that uh, were discussed also in the previous slide. We basically unregister them whenever we detect there is a, a bonding, uh, whenever we detect that if their parent devices, their net devs, are being enslaved to a bonding or teaming uh, model. So we basically unregister them and register them. So uh, we uh, 
notify uh, current uh, users the configuration uh, changed, you need to re-establish uh, your resources. Uh, and whenever we bring them up, they are basically uh, kind of stub devices, devices that are used for port management, so they are uh, not used for traffic. Similar to ETH0 and ETH1 that are being uh, enslaved, they are mo mostly used for uh, port management. Um, and uh, whenever we detect this enslavement and we see that it is associated with the same device, we basically instantiate a new uh, uh, RDMA device that uh, is associated with the, with the bonding, with the teaming uh, model. So we now have a single uh, net dev that is represented towards the stack and has its own IP address, and we uh, have similar uh, use and feel for the RDMA uh, device. <coughs> Uh, now, how basically uh, hashing uh, for the RDMA device is being done? So basically, uh, this is a general implementation, and each vendor can choose its own uh, its own pick. Uh, how to route the commands? Of course, this is an only control path. How to route those commands of uh, creating uh, the hardware object to the actual hardware? In our implementation, we use we typically use uh, PF0 for. Uh, routing those uh, commands. Uh, again, uh, it's only a way to get into the hardware, the actual uh, physical port that is being chosen, is, as I described uh, earlier, uh, through the port affinity of the transport uh, object attribute. Uh, regarding uh, link aggregation and LACP, so whenever Linux bonding is configured with uh, LACP, um, it actually implements the LACP protocol uh, in software in the bonding module, uh, or we plan to also add support that LACP will be uh, running in the hardware or firmware. Uh, basically, it is required for uh, many physical functions to single uh, physical uh, port mappings like uh, Flex 10 and NPAR. Uh, but also uh, in what we call uh, uh, multi-host environments where a single uh, NIC silicon can, uh, can be used by multiple physical machines. I will touch this in the last slide uh, as well. Uh, a few words about the hardware uh, band uh, model. So uh, basically this is uh, the actual logic in the hardware that uh, that implements the data path for send and receiving uh, the RDMA traffic and the uh, user mode Ethernet traffic uh, from the right uh, port. So um, basically, uh, network uh, network uh, traffic, like uh, the IP stack traffic, TCP IP traffic, is being sent from the physical port to the matching uh, net dev and up the stack. And for RDMA traffic, we basically uh, choose the, the PF0 uh, in our implementation, as I mentioned uh, earlier. Now, in the next two slides, I uh, will touch, uh, I will discuss how basically we want to expose uh, RDMA uh, bonding in the virtual case. The earlier slide was the native case. So we see two options, and uh, we would like to support both of them. Uh, the first option is more for uh, legacy and what uh, users as usually uh, uh, configure or configure today. <coughs> so in uh, our plans to support uh, SRIOV VMs and non-SRIOV VMs, uh, our, uh, through this, uh, as you see in this uh, slide, is basically we have the, the Linux uh, OBS uh, bridge, which is the software representation for the hardware e-switch. Uh, so basically, we can see on the right that uh, uh, SRIOV VMs are connected through uh, their matching uh, virtual function. They have a representor net device uh, in the OS stack. Um, we have ETH0, which represents the uplink. All of these are associated with the Linux switch device, uh, which is the architecture uh, of the switch device. And uh, these are connected or enslaved to the Linux uh, bridge. Also, we have the on the uh, upper uh, of the slide, we see the non-SRIO VVMs that are connected through the VTH to the uh, Linux uh, bridge. 
And we also can see the internal uh, leg of uh, the Linux bridge, which is connected to the actual hypervisor or the actual PF uh, stack. This exposes the, new, the net dev of uh, usually BR0. It has its own IP for the hypervisor stack. And on top of that, we basically instantiate the RDMA device with the same mechanics I discussed in the earlier slide. So again, we have uh, for bonding, sorry, for uh, the Linux bridge, we have uh, BR0 and the uh, associated RDMA device for the native OS. So j just a few words of, on traffic flow here. So basically, uh, SRI or VVMs can send traffic directly through the VF uh, to the wire or to the other uh, VMs but uh, can also, according to obvious uh, rules, can go through what we call slow path or uh, miss path, can go up the stack through their own representor and do the switching in uh, software to the Linux uh, bridge. So both options are supported. So just, this is just a recap and later on I'll, I'll show you how, uh, how uh, bonding uh, is supported in this configuration. Uh, I'll go quickly to the next slide, uh, which, is, uh, which represents the option two, where basically in this option we don't, the only difference between the first and the second is that in this option we don't use the internal link, uh, leg of the Linux uh, OVS bridge. Uh, we use, we basically instantiate kind of a virtual uh, port uh, in the Linux switch device for the PF, for the hypervisor itself. So, you can see that uh, there's no uh, BR0 leg. The ups, up, uh, uplink now is being represented by a rep uh, phi zero, uh, which is enslaved to the bridge. We've added uh, a representer for ETH0 in the Linux bridge, which is basically connected to ETH0, uh, the interface that is uh, serving the hypervisor. So in this way, uh, the hypervisor is kind of a first-class citizen as, uh, that gets the same offloads as uh, the VMs. Uh, for instance, if we want to do the enjoy in the PF from hardware-based uh, forwarding, uh, then with the internal leg, we basically go up the stack and the forwarding is being done through the Linux bridge. Uh, many implementations do that by misflow, so uh, this traffic gets uh, most penalty because uh, the, this traffic goes up only if it doesn't match any of the uh, uh, VM, uh, actual VM uh, matches. And in this case, we have a specific forwarding in the hardware that we plumb in the Mac VLAN or 5 tuple or whatever rule that forwards the traffic uh, to the actual uh, ETH0 uh, net dev. Uh, of course, we can introduce some optimizations to uh, the option one, where we basically, as Ronnie, my colleague, presented earlier, we can add a kind of a flow tag for the PF also. So uh, whenever uh, the PF is using the internal leg, we can also uh, aid the software-based forwarding by having a flow tag that, specify, uh, that, classify, that is being classified in the hardware. Um, so, now how basically uh, RDMA bonding fits in in uh, the virtualization model. So we can see in this uh, slide, I know there's uh, many details, but uh, we s we've seen most of them in the earlier slides. So basically, uh, we can see here that now we have uh, two physical ports. I'm highlighting the changes. So we have two physical ports. We have now uh, representers for the two uplinks. We have rep uh, phi zero and now rep phi one. <coughs> and those uh, representers are basically connected on left to the Linux uh, bonding uh, and then enslaved to the Linux uh, bridge. So basically on the left, uh, we can see the RDMA device for the hypervisor. It's a single device, same, uh, same as before, uh, but all the logic of the bonding is being done uh, in the Linux bonding model for the TCP IP stack and uh, in the hardware bond in the e-switch now for RDMA and, uh, and uh, user mode Ethernet. And for the virtual machines, the SIV virtual machines, uh, we basically have uh, several options. 
Uh, one of them is uh, basically allocate or associate each virtual machine with a different physical port. And this, this way we do the load balancing. And the other option, in this option, it's basically transparent for the VMs. Uh, there's no need for administration in the VMs of establishing kind of a modeling model. Uh, same, same interface is being instantiated in the, uh, single uh, interface is being instantiated in the VMs. But for users that want to control the hash or maybe are more used to the uh, Linux bonding hash or the sophis uh, sophisticated or more uh, extended capabilities of the teaming model of defining the hash, they can associate the two VFs uh, to a VM. Uh, each uh, VF from uh, each PF, each VF from each PF, and then on top of that, build uh, a bonding or teaming model uh, and slave and enslave those net devs in the VM itself. Uh, so basically, both configurations can, uh, can be supported. Uh, regarding uh, HA, so a functionality I didn't mention is that the hardware is capable on failover to basically remap the transport objects that I mentioned before from uh, actual physical port to the, to, from the uh, failing physical port to the actual uh, active port. So this is transparent, this is done in hardware, and whenever the failed port comes back, the traffic uh, goes back to the uh, active uh, port that was originally associated with, a, with the transport object. So uh, this is basically uh, the virtualization and uh, RDMA uh, bonding. Uh, this slide is uh, more to show you that also whenever you use tunneling uh, and how uh, basically tunneling fits in, also tunneling uh, in this uh, configuration can support RDA bonding and uh, it's very similar to, to what uh, was described before. So basically uh, the chain changes here are mostly on the left where we see here uh, the obvious uh, uh, VXLAN uh, bridge. Uh, that is uh, associated with the UDP IP stack uh, of uh, the VXLAN net device. So basically, uh, tunneling traffic uh, from slow path can go from non SRV VMs through the Linux bridge, through the OVS VXLAN bridge, and uh, encapsulated uh, through the VXLAN net device. And uh, in combination with hardware encapsulation and decapsulation, the SRIOV. Uh, VMs uh, go through the VF and through the embedded switch and enjoy the encapsulation uh, in the hardware. And uh, instantiating uh, uh, bonding in this configuration is the same. We basically have the add the representer for phi, phi 1 and associate, and associate phi 0 and phi 1 with a bonding model. I'm running out of time, so I'll uh, uh, show the last slide uh, very quickly. So, uh, m one more exciting uh, feature that we have here is the multi-PCI socket NIC. As I discussed before, uh, we, we do have uh, a feature which we call multi-host, where we basically can connect a single NIC to multiple uh, CPUs. And in, in this configuration, we basically use a single server um, a single server to connect those uh, several links. So basically, uh, the NIC shows to the system as a multi uh, endpoint NIC, where each endpoint resides on a different uh, bus or a different uh, CPU socket. So basically, instead of uh, sending from one CPU through the QPI to the root complex and the NIC, you can basically uh, uh, bypass the QPI and send the uh, traffic from the CPU directly to the local root complex and to the to the NIC. So, uh, how is this related to the Linux bonding? So, uh, basically, in such a configuration, you represent two network devices in one uh, server. You can work uh, in such a configuration if your application is aware of uh, multiple net devs and can uh, actually uh, decide or uh, DMOOCs in, uh, internally how to choose the right net dev. Okay, uh, so in this configuration, we basically use the Linux uh, bonding to bond those two net devices, have the same use and feel. We have a single net device exposed to the stack, 
and uh, and uh, enjoy this uh, QPI bypass. I'll I'll stop here because I'm yeah, we have time. no more time. Uh, sorry.